I apologize on their behalf. As you turn in your grave, if you had been alive, you'd possibly be 107 years today. But you are people, some of them, in their lack of wisdom, chose to remove you from power. They gave you only a few years to be present in this world. And during those few years that you are present in this world, you shook not only Ghana but Africa so very fundamentally that although your mortal remains were interred, your spirit is alive and well. And is that spirit that occupies our minds and hearts today as we remind ourselves that the only way in which Africa will realize our potential is through the path of unity. I know as you lie in your grave, great Osagiefo, there is a sense in which in a manner so completely invisible to us, you are turning uncomfortably and weeping uncontrollably because your continent is bleeding. It is bleeding in every corner, in our heart, in the Congo, she bleeds. That country that is so rich is yet the poorest nation in Africa. But it does not stop bleeding only in the Congo. It also bleeds in our own in Somalia. That country which could be very rich he is only famous for the wrong things. Men killing men for no reason. But he doesn't stop bleeding there. It is also bleeding in our armpit in Equatorial Guinea. That country that God gave so much oil. That oil was long captured by one family and they are using it for their benefit to the detriment of their people. And it doesn't stop bleeding there. In Central African Republic and in Libya and in Mauritania and in Mali, your continent is torn asunder. And we who have gathered here today are asking ourselves the fundamental question, what must we do to save Africa? And that is why today when we are looking at Africa and when we are remembering you on that 24th day of May in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, we cannot help but remember how animated you are. We cannot help but remember that what you saw 50 years ago is turning out to be as evergreen as when you spoke them. You told us then that our unity was going to be our salvation from other civilization. Today, Africa is said to be rising, but the question we are asking, for whom is Africa rising? Today, the minerals in our belly are being exploited, Osagiev. The uranium in Niger is being taken away from France to France. The manganese in Ghana, in your own country, is being taken away. Even the cocoa, which you must cons have consumed as a young man, is taken away in the same manner that God made it to be converted into something in Switzerland. Your people have not learned to, learn to add value to it. They have an apology for a factory in Takoradi, but it does very little, Osagiefo. In other words, there is a lot to be done. We can hear you telling us that we need to have free movement of goods and services in this continent. 
I can now inform you that when they met on the 27th day of July in Kigali, Rwanda, they created a passport, but that passport is only known to the president. The people of Africa have no idea what it is. But they have started, so we must believe that going forward, every African will carry what is an African passport, which will allow them to move, as you contemplated, from Dhaka in Senegal to Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, from Cape Town in South Africa to Cairo in Egypt, and that they'll be able to move without free letter and hindrance. The Osagie, for we remember you. But we also remind ourselves that when we talk about unity, we are not saying that we should strike down our traditional institutions. We are simply saying that our traditional institution must be integrated in our modern scheme of doing things. And I must tell you that today here, we are agreeing with Ali Mazurui that indeed what others think is the Tower of Babel can be a power of Babel and that this continent can be united and our diversity would be a cultural and linguistic mosaic which would be our strength and the attraction to other parts of the world. I personally think that uh, what the Ghanaians did back then when they dethroned, when they did a coup d'etat to remove Kwame Nkrumah was such a shameful thing. Remember that Kwame Nkrumah made sure that Africa, that Ghana was the first African country uh, to get uh, independence and that credit should be given to him. He led his country his, into independence. Through his pan-African mindset, African, Africans and Africans were enlightened. African countries saw that one of them was liberated and so they saw a golden light, they saw an opportunity for them also to be independent, you know. But the West was not happy with this thing. How can you just get independent? You who made this country independent, you are going to do something about you. And that something is what PLO Lumumba is going to talk about. And PLO Lumumba, with his pan-African heart, he apologized on the behalf of the Ghanaians to the late Kwame Nkrumah. Because that was a great man. Kwame Nkrumah was a great man. He just doesn't have to fall like that. We have even a statue in Ghana in honor of him. He led that country into independence. And to me personally, though I'm not a Ghanaian, I'm still an African, I feel it was a bad way to, to do something to somebody who brought you out of independence. Somebody who liberated you from the shackles of colonialism. So let's watch this video and get to know what really happened and see the consequences of uh, dethroning Kwame Nkrumah and how that has affected Africans. Later on, I'll be explaining to you how it happened, the history and the critical um, impact it has had towards the African continent. Okay, this is my part of critical review. I just uh, give, you, give you a spoiler, okay? Let's, let's jump in. Osagie, for as I continue to speak to you in your grave, there is the tendency that I may speak until the cows come home, but what is the wisdom in doing that? You are so clear in 1963 that is your clarity that we must use to remind ourselves that Africa can rise. But as I posed a little Harley, for whom is it rising? Is it rising for the Indians? Is it rising for the Lebanese? Is it rising for the Chinese? Is it rising for the Americans? Or is it rising for the whole world with Africa as the bearers of the weight for our benefit? We want to live in a continent where we are respected, but we know that it's only through unity, and we believe that the academics will carry their weight so that our education has its value. Those of us who are trained in the sciences will no longer allow their knowledge to sit in libraries, but that knowledge will be utilized by the political class for the sake of the transformation of the lives of the people. We hope that our unity will create an environment where our young men and women 
will not be humiliated at the embassies of Australia, Canada, the United States of America, and little European countries that they may acquire their passports as a way of escaping from Africa, which provides no opportunity and no hope for young men and women. We can do it, we must do it, because if we don't do it, we ourselves will be done. So Africa must rise, because if Africa does not rise, Africa will perish. In memory of the Osage for Dr. Kwame Nukuruma, the first president of the Republic of Ghana and the most renowned Pan-Africanist, we, it is not lost on me that Ghana is celebrating this day in his honor and memory, and it is not lost on me that the great Kwame Nkrumah has now been fully rehabilitated in the life of Ghanaians and in the life and minds of Africans. A writing about Pan-Africanism, Kenya's renowned scholar Ali Mazurui says that when one thinks about the unity of Africa and the Pan-African movement, several names come to mind. Names such as South Africa's Nelson Holisasa Mandela, and Tanzania's Julius Kambarage Nyerere, but no name is greater than that of Ghana's Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. <laughs> Indeed, we will remember that a few years ago, at the turn of the century, Africans, both in the continent and outside of it, were asked to vote for the greatest African who ever lived. And unanimously, they said that it was Osage for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. <laughs> it is therefore right and fitting to be invited to speak in memory of a man such as that. On Monday, we had the occasion in the first series of our lectures to examine the status of politics in Africa, and we agreed unanimously that the problem of Africa is simply and squarely one of leadership. We then asked ourselves what has been the impact of poor leadership in Africa, and we determined for ourselves that indeed African economies continue to punch below their weight because our politics is wrong. We agreed with Liberia's Johnson Salif that Africa is poor because she is poorly governed. Today, we pose the question, what it is or what is it that has undermined African unity? And before we begin to talk about contemporary Africa, we must ask ourselves, where did the rain start beating us? We must go deep into history and ask ourselves why this continent and her people have been the most abused throughout human history. As early as the 15th century, this continent was an attraction to other civilizations. Explorers came into this part of the world under the guise of looking for resources, and they did not stop there. They proceeded to invade the land of Africa and, in a manner of speaking, harvested Africans, and more than half the population of Africa was taken out of this continent to be enslaved. When the project of slavery lost its shine and luster, another project came into Africa. Africa was parceled out in 1884 in Berlin, Germany. The French took their peace. 
The Dutch took their peace. The Germans had their share. The Portuguese had their portion. And the British had their share. And Africa has never been the same again. When the colonial project lost its luster, once again another project was instituted in a much more subtle way, the neo-colonial project. And even now, Africa is not at ease. One need only look at Africa as it stands today to understand that our continent is in dire straits. When we move from the southern part of Africa, even in that land of Nelson Mandela, they are not at ease. They may describe themselves as the rainbow nation, but there is a sense in which that country is not completely at ease. The Africans are still reeling from the pain of apartheid. And if one moves into the neighborhood in Namibia, the Namibians are still grappling with the pernicious and pervasive presence of a system of government that treats them as second-class citizens. And when one moves a little farther in the north, in Angola, into Mozambique, they are not at ease. Some of the problems were inherited from the erstwhile colonial masters but some we have created ourselves. So that today, when we look at Africa, Africa has the infamy of being the home of the most conflicts in the world of different intensities. Elections have come, and after every election in Africa, we enter into an arena of conflict Right now, in Zambia, after they concluded their elections, they are still quarreling. They are rising e against each other. The Bemba are not at ease with the Chichewa. And in Mozambique, the Shoshangani are not at ease with their neighbors. In Zimbabwe, the country is falling apart. And the Ndebele are not at ease with the Shona. In Central African Republic, the country is not at ease. In South Sudan, the Nwer and the Dinka are not at ease. In the home of the African Union, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the Oromo are rising up and they say they can no longer be ruled by the Tigrinya and Africa is not at ease. In Nigeria, the Igbo are not at ease, the Fulani are not at ease, the Yoruba are not at ease. Even in your little Ghana, in little low intensity, the Fante may be at ease with the Akan and the Eve, but the undertones is that our continent is not united. Which begs the question, what must we then do? Is it a new realization? We are gathered here today in honor of a man who could see these things ahead of his time. I had last night the advantage of reading a statement that was made by one who was a member of the delegation, the Ghanaian delegation in 1963, Kofi Batsa. And he writes about Kwame Nkrumah, the man who could see tomorrow. And he remembers so very distinctly on the 24th day of May, 1963, when the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah was given the opportunity to speak to his fellow African leaders in an animated fashion, Kofi Basa remembers, he abandoned his written script and pointed at all the African leaders who are there much more prominently, he remembers, he pointed at Ethiopia's Hail Selassie and told him, you Hail Selassie, we will not be there if we do not unite. And once he had finished with Hail Selassie, he turned over to Nigeria's Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa and he told him, if we do not unite, even you will not be there. And he did not stop there. He turned to Fulba Maga of Dahomey, now the Benin, and told him, if you, we do not unite, you will not be there and I will not be there. And as if you were a prophet, so soon thereafter, 
they had all been overthrown, including the Osagie for himself. Unity, or is it disunity, is Africa's Achilles heel. Let us understand the Africa that we are talking about. It is an Africa that today is divided into 54 odd countries. It is an Africa that has over 3,000 ethnicities and over 2,000 languages. It is an Africa that, as I've said, was parceled out in Berlin. It is an Africa which Europeans still refer to strangely in the following terms and is the only continent that is referred to as such that Africa is sometimes described as Anglophone Africa to suggest that there is a part of Africa which speaks English. Even when only 1% of the population speaks English, we are referred to as Anglophone. And Ghana is therefore Anglophone. Kenya is Anglophone. And they don't stop there. They go to the former French colonies and they look at a few leaders speaking French and they say that is Francophone. And we who have the advantage of going to school also proudly refer to ourselves as Anglophones and Francophones. And they do not stop there. They go to the former Portuguese colonies and they say these are also Lusophones. No other continent in the world is referred to in those terms. So what were these circumstances surrounding the coup that led to the Nkrumah's removal from power and its impact to the people of Ghana? First of all, we need to understand the background of Kwame Nkrumah's uh, leadership. Kwame Nkrumah was a visionary leader who played a crucial role in Ghana's gaining independence from the British rule in 1957. I told you it was the first African country to gain independence. Ethiopia was not colonized, Liberia and Sierra Leone were not colonized, Liberia and Sierra Leone were countries which were liberated by the slave owners themselves. They decided to bring it back after the French Revolution, slave trade was ended, uh, so a liberated state had to be established. So they established a lot of, they established a country in West Africa, Liberia, which means liberty, and um, Sierra Leone. That's why they were not colonized, you know. So Sierra Leone and, Ameri and, uh, and Sierra, Le Sierra Leone and Liberia borrow a lot from the American culture. That's why you find the flag of Sierra Leone closely resembling the one of the United States of America. But in Ethiopia, Ethiopia fought against the Italians. They fought against them and they conquered them, which tells us that it's not about the weapon, it's about the leader you have, you know. So Kwame Nkrumah has brought his country to independence in 1957. So what did he aim? He aimed to build a strong and a united nation focusing on economic development and social justice. However, over time, his leadership style faced criticism for being too centralized and authoritarian. Centralized and authoritarian. How did Africans know Kwame Nkrumah's leadership was centralized and authoritarian? Somebody must have planted a seed somewhere. Okay, the second one is economic challenges and unrest. Ghana faced economic difficulties during Nkrumah's presidency. The country invested heavily in ambitious projects, leading to financial strain. This economic downturn combined with allegation of corruption within the government fueled discontent among various segments of the population. Another one is international relations and cold war politics. So it was a uh, uh, things were piling up against Kwame Nkrumah. So according to international relations and cold war politics, Nkrumah was a strong advocate for African unity and often positioned Ghana as a leader in fight against colonialism. However, his alignment with socialist ideologies and support for countries like Cuba during the Cold War era drew concern from the Western powers. This contributed to a strained relationship between Ghana and some influential nations. You know those influential nations. Next is the coup d'etat in 1966. 
nine years later. On February 24, 1966, while Nkrumah was on a diplomatic trip, a group of military officers staged a coup d'etat, overthrowing the government. The reason for the coup d'etat were complex, including dissatisfaction with Nkrumah's leadership, economic challenges, and concerns about his alignment with socialist ideologies. How did this in impact Ghana? The coup d'etat marked a turning point in Ghana's history. While some celebrated Nkrumah's removal, others were disappointed. The country underwent a period of instability, with changes in government and policies. The overthrow had mixed consequences, and impacting the positive aspects of Nkrumah's legacy and the challenges faced during his rule. The coup d'etat that led to the dethroning of Kwame Nkrumah was a significant event that shaped Ghana's trajectory. It highlighted the, the complexities of leadership, the challenges faced by a newly independent nation, and the influence of, uh, and the influence of international politics. Ghana's journey after the overthrow involved navigating through political challenges and striving for stability. Of course, you can't have stability once you stage a coup d'etat. There has to be some bump, bump. So understanding the, this historical event is crucial in appreciating the resilience and determination of the Ghanaian people in their pursuit of a better future. To me, um, I personally think that Ghanaians would have found a better way to do this. This man brought Ghana into independence. Africans will just be Africans. Always wanting to be in power. Always, always. Once we get into power, we don't want to leave the power. We want to die there. That is the nature of Africans. See what happened to Kwame Nkrumah. He brought the country into independence. This was the same man who advocated for African Union, same currency. When a conference was held in Addis Ababa, he led the Monrovia, and other people led the Casablanca. They had disagreements. Africans will just be Africans. Africans will just be Africans. We need to have a common goal. We can't survive individually. We can survive by union. It's easier to break one stick, but it's very hard to break a bunch of sticks. Individually, we can't, we can't, we can never, because we were so divided into small pieces that we can't fight them. We can't, we can't, we can't. We only need to conquer through union, coming together as one people sharing one heritage. And that's the spirit. That's the spirit of pan-Africanism. To me, I don't think Ghanaians did the right thing over here. There are other ways of dealing with things, not this one. This is so shameful. So shameful to somebody who brought you out of independence. So shameful. But Africans are Africans. Uh, if, you are, uh, if you are a good African, do subscribe to the channel. Subscribe. Um, support the channel on Patreon. Uh, you can always support the channel by placing something small. Also, uh, share the channel to your friends and families. Yeah, that's one way of helping my work. So, I'll uh, see you in the next one.